extra intestinal. So those were all intestinal functions of butyrate. Now we're moving outside of the intestine, beyond the intestine. And so we know that butyrate plays a role in insulin sensitivity as well as a role in metabolism of fat. And let's talk about how it does these things. So you can see here in this first study, uh, just recently published, the role of the gut microbiome derived short chain fatty acid butyrate in hepatobiliary disease, so liver disease. Short chain fatty acid butyrate produced from fermentable carbs by gut microbiota in the colon has multiple beneficial effects on human health. At the intestinal level, butyrate regulates metabolism, helps in the transepithelial transport of fluids, in other words, water fluid, inhibits inflammation, which we talked about earlier, and induces the defense barrier. The liver receives a large amount of butyrate or short chain fatty acids via the blood flowing from the gut. There's a, a vein called the portal vein there. And butyrate helps prevent non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, gallbladder and liver inflammation, and then cancer and liver injuries. It ameliorates metabolic diseases, including insulin resistance and obesity, and plays a direct role in preventing fatty liver disease. How does that happen? There are a number of mechanisms. One of the primary mechanisms of butyrate on in reduction of damage to the liver is in your gut lining, there are all types of bacteria, and we're just going to draw them like this, and they're producing little toxins, these toxins that are produced by bacteria referred to as LPS, lipopolysaccharides. What they can do is they can punch microscopic holes. If this is, again, the gut luminin or the gut, the tube of the gut, they punch holes through the gut lining, hence leaky gut. And then they traverse to the liver where they can then proceed to create damage to the liver, LPS. This has been studied really well, these lipopolysaccharides causing damage to the liver. Well, one of the functions of butyrate, as we mentioned earlier, was to seal off the barrier, right? To help produce that layer of mucus, to help create IgA, which can bind and re reduce the potential for these uh, chemical toxins produced by bacteria to enter into the portal circulation and damage the liver. So again, butyrate's playing a role even beyond its role in the gut. It, there's this old adage, a lot, of, a lot of you have probably heard of it, all diseases end and begin in the gut. And um, you know, butyrate's protective mechanism in the gut can prevent a lot of those diseases from spreading, or a lot of those problems from spreading from the gut into the bloodstream, creating systemic problems. But even beyond that, let's uh, let's look at this diagram. Um, you know, recently published in Frontiers of Endocrinology on the extra intestinal manifestations of butyrate and its function. So as you can see here, again, dietary fiber consumption leads to a fermentation process by healthy bacteria of that fiber into butyrate. Butyrate then, in effect, is an energy source for colon cells, but uh, butyrate also penetrates through and triggers a gut hormone release. It also enters portal circulation, traverses to the liver. Small, as you can see here, small amounts of butyrate reach also systemic circulation, and the effect of that butyrate systemically is an increase in thermogenesis, which means we're burning fat, but it's also improved beta cell function. Well, what is a beta cell? This is the pancreas, and beta cells produce insulin. And so, of course, insulin being the hormone that helps our, regulate our blood sugar, and without it, we have a, uh, well, with, that, with low amounts or with or resistant insulin, we end up, uh, you know, trending toward diabetes or pre-diabetic states. So we know butyrate, systemically getting into the circulation can help with both fat burning as well as, uh, as insulin production through the beta cells. Now, we also have this study here from neuroscience uh, letters Butyrate neuroepigenetics and the gut microbiome. Can a high fiber diet improve brain health? 
just some highlights from this study. Um, butyrate can protect the brain and enhance plasticity in neurological disease models. Again, these are, these are study models, not these research studies are pending in humans, but again, these are their findings, preliminarily findings. Gut microbiota produce butyrate by fermenting carbohydrates in a high fiber diet. The hypothesis, a high fiber diet can elevate butyrate to prevent, treat brain disorders. Potentially, yes. I think the research is just starting to culminate uh, on this and we don't really have anything definitive, but it's certainly something scientists are looking at, the impact on the brain and on the nervous system as far as butyrate is concerned as well. There are research studies that link uh, neurological disorders to low fiber. There are a number of inflammatory disorders linked to low fiber intake. Again, this is a slide that shows you kind of food sources for butyrate. Um, and you'll see here fermented vegetables, and so this would be things like sauerkraut, um, if you like cabbage, fermented cabbage, or fermented cauliflower, fermented carrots, all good choices there. Um, cheese can contain butyrate, so these are all dairy, right? So yogurt, and again, if you're gonna use dairy, my advice here, stick to A2, grass-fed, organic. Otherwise, you run the risk of you know, multiple pesticide exposures. You also run the risk of reacting to that non-A2. There's a casein in dairy, um, and, if, and if it's A1 casein, it's been linked to autoimmune illness. If you haven't watched my crash course on dairy as a trigger for autoimmune disease, you might want to go back and check that out if you're not familiar between uh, the differences between A1 and A2 milk. But... If you're gonna use the dairy, it needs to be this. Now, if you're gluten sensitive, there's a caveat here. Many people, about 50% of the people with gluten sensitivity in some research studies have allergies or allergic reactions to dairy. So I would say if you're one of those individuals, be cautious. I mean, you may be watching the show and thinking, I wanna get more butyrate, and, and you may be tempted here, but if you're reacting to that dairy, not a good idea to consume those foods. I would stick to this over here. Now, some of you might also be thinking, um, you know, what else can I eat? Well, there are a lot of vegetables that contain fiber that you could consume that also would help your GI tract make butyrate. But one of the problems here with a high fiber diet, there are several, let's talk about high fiber diets because some studies show that high fiber for some people increases constipation and inflammation in the GI tract. This isn't for everyone. I'm not, I'm, I don't want you guys to think I'm generalizing here for all of you. But, you know, it's commonly said, doc, you go to the doctor, you're constipated, they say eat more fiber. You, you've already, you already eat enough fiber and you're still dealing with this problem. And, you know, what do you do uh, when that's the only advice that you're getting? Again, there's a, there's a, uh, a large, uh, percentage of the population that has problems with high fiber. So how do you get your, my, we're going back to how do you get your butyrate if you can't consume fiber because when you consume it, it bothers you. And this is, is actually a lot of the people following like carnivore diets or keto diets that are lower in fiber, higher in animal products. One of the reasons they do this is because they fit that group of individuals that when they eat high fiber, they don't feel good. That eating a lot of plant-based foods wrecks them. A lot of different reasons why that can happen. And so, again, if you're, if you're one of those individuals but you're allergic to dairy, butyrate's going to be a tough, uh, a tough thing to get in your diet. So that's why I'm bringing this up. You want to you wanna make sure um, that if you're one of those people struggling and you can't eat those foods, you might want to, this is where you might want to consider supplementation. So again, high fiber we can get butyrate indirectly from high fiber diets. But one of the other caveats is beyond whether or not you react to food, uh, fruits and vegetables with fiber poorly, again, many of you do, there's also this problem, which is antibiotic use. And so many of you have this history of antibiotic use and so your gut microbiomes are, um, are in poor shape and so you may be eating this fiber, but you don't have, you know, adequate microbial activity within your gut because of antibiotic use where, where you, so you can't get to the butyrate. You can't generate it very effectively. And so 
This is where um, if you've taken an antibiotic uh, or taken multiple antibiotics, you might want to consider in this situation a prebiotic plus a probiotic because taking those, two, and what a prebiotic is, is generally it's, it's some degree, it's some type of resistant starch or fiber. Uh, large arabinogalactin is a common one used, um, but it's, it's oftentimes referred to as a prebiotic. And then a probiotic are the bacteria, right? So what you're doing is you're putting in your gut, you're putting the fiber in with the bacteria in a supplement form to get to the butyrate. Um, and then some people might just consider supplementing with the butyrate directly, which is oftentimes referred to as a post Biotic. So you're hearing these new. You probably are hearing these new terms if you're, if you're tuned in to the nutrition realm. You know the prebiotic, the probiotic, and the postbiotic. But if you've got a history of antibiotics, you definitely should be on a probiotic. You know both both before, during, and after the antibiotic use to to try to ensure that this is not happening to you where you can't get to butyrate. Because if you can't get to butyrate. You increase the risk of leaky gut. You increase the risk of the development of autoimmune problems. You increase the risk of gaining weight, and you potentially increase the risk of certain types of cancer in your intestine, but also increase the risk of insulin resistance, which can lead to a host of other types of cardiovascular risks, which you don't want to have, right? So you need butyrate. Butyrate's a pretty important uh, substance for the overall gut integrity and the gut health. And again, if you've got that antibiotic history, or if you're not drinking filtered water, remember that there are naturally occurring antibiotics in your drinking water in the form of chlorine. You know, this is chlorine is an additive to the water. And, um, you know, again, if you're if you're drinking chlorinated water, it acts as an antibiotic. That's you know most a lot of the antibiotics have chlorine or other halo, halogenated biocides in them, like um, chlorine, bromine, and fluoride, commonly used to destroy bacteria. And then there are also there are a number of different food additives and other chemicals that can behave similar to an antibiotic, which is one of the reasons why so many people have such poor microbiomes in their GI tract. So. Again, it, filter your water, get the chlorine out of your water. When it, once it gets to your house, you wanna have a good filter in place, a good granular activated carbon filter, a good reverse osmosis filter would do the trick for that. And of course, limit your use uh, of these unless you absolutely need them. You don't let your doctor prescribe you an antibiotic just in case. And we see this a lot where doctors prescribe the antibiotic not confirming that there's an infection, just you know, maybe there might be, so let's try the antibiotic. Uh, as, a, as a treatment, that's a bad idea. You should use these very, very judiciously. Obviously, we wanna be able to get to that butyrate, and if we can't, because we don't have a good uh, probiotic base, and the fiber, this is, this is in a lot of part how a lot of people start reacting, is they've got such a long-term history of using antibiotics, their microbiome is decimated, and then when they try to eat a bunch of fiber, they have different species of microbes in their gut. Those microbes don't do well with all that fiber, it creates you know, this other scenario over here, and so now you don't know what to do because again, the food sources, as far as, as, as um, butyrate directly, direct butyrate are concerned, is that you know, if you're gonna eat butyrate directly, you can get it here, but if you don't tolerate that, it's not good, and if you're allergic to the dairy, it's also not good. So again, Use antibiotics judiciously. Now, should you supplement with butyrate? I think first, before we talk about supplementation, um, let's talk about testing for butyrate deficiency. There are tests that can be done. Your doctor can order them that will measure your level of butyrate in your intestine. And I highly recommend that if you're, um, if you're considering whether or not butyrate may, may be a good move for you, get testing done. Um, and this, again, can be done with a stool sample. Now, if you're gonna supplement with butyrate, uh, relatively safe dose is 300 to 900 milligrams per day orally in capsule form is very safe uh, with no major side effects or no major problems. If you struggle with constipation, if you struggle, if you've been told you had IBS-C, um, this may be something that you might wanna consider supplementing to support healthy bowel motility and bowel function. If you've ever had a colonoscopy and they found polyps, um, this may be another indication that you might consider using um, supplemental 
butyrate as a, as a tool. So again, IBS. type C constipation or polyps. If you've been told you have leaky gut by your doctor, you know, that might be another indication for you to maybe consider using butyrate supplementally to support healthy bowel function. But, you know, ultimately it's always best in my opinion to test as opposed to guess. You certainly could use it because there's no real great danger in taking supplemental um, butyrate you know, you're certainly welcome to try it if you feel like it might be supportive or helpful for you. But if you've got these situations going on, you might really consider asking your doctor whether or not supplementing butyrate is right for you. If you've got questions about butyrate, make sure you ask them below. And as always, don't forget to tune in every Thursday at 1230 for live Q&A. So if you want to show up on Thursday and ask your butyrate questions, feel free to do so. Thanks so much for tuning in to Dr. Osborne's Zone. If this information was helpful, make sure you smash the like button and share it with somebody who you love. Thanks so much.